Um, okay, I think it's time. We're going to talk now. This one is about BDD acceptance tests. So please welcome to the stage Chris and Rhea. Well, hello everyone, um, and thank you for coming to our talk. Um, so yeah, as uh, Matt said, uh, Chris and I will be talking to you about acceptance tests, BDD, and we'll have an example in Go. Uh, we'll be taking any questions at the end of the presentation. So quick intros, um, I'm Ria Dutani. Um, I'm kind of at the start of my software development career, so I'm literally excited about everything to do with it. Um, and in my spare time, uh, I help disadvantaged backgrounds in the tech industry to learn how to code. Um, and this is my boss, Chris James. Um, <laughs> he's been developing for a long period of time, and he also wrote Learn Go with Tests, which some of you might know. Um, it's brilliant, so I definitely urge you to have a look at it. Oh yeah, and please feel free to connect with us on Twitter and check out our blogs. So we both work at SolPay and we're hiring. <laughs> um, we were founded in 2019 and we've drastically grown all over the world since then. I think we're hitting almost a thousand Salters now. And a little bit more about us. So we're in the payments um, industry and our mission is to simply help merchants grow their businesses. Our target market is small, medium-sized um, enterprises, and here's like a little roadmap of what we're currently working on or what's in our horizon. Um, so yeah, if you're interested at working in a fun environment where you're challenged and empowered to create great systems, please come and find us at our stand at the back of it there. Cool, I'm gonna pass it on to Chris, who will start our talk. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about uh, BDD, what it's for, how it can help your team's productivity, and how to approach it with Go. But before we get into BDD, I just want to talk about what motivates Rio and I. We want to work in a good, high-performing team. But why is this important to us? Well, in my experience, I found that the nature of a project is actually a fairly poor predictor as to how enjoyable and rewarding it can be. I've worked on really boring projects. I've not sent rockets to Mars. I haven't helped cure any diseases, and I haven't disrupted any industries. But because of the environments and the ways that we worked, the experiences that I've had over my career have been extremely rewarding, and I've become a, a reasonable developer for it. Charity Majors did a talk uh, a few months ago where she said that great teams produce great engineers, and I really subscribe to that point of view. I think it's a real privilege to work in a supportive team uh, and a really high-performing team that always challenges itself to get better at its craft. But what exactly is a high-performing team? Uh, there's lots of research and opinion around this. Uh, the State of DevOps report describes four metrics that they see as uh, what constitutes a high-performing team. High-performing teams deploy to, uh, deploy to production multiple times per day on demand. They have a low mean time to changes, which means they should be able to go from commit to production in under an hour. They should be able to recover from any faults really quickly, again, ideally under an hour. And ideally, the changes they're pushing shouldn't fail too often. But what does it take to be able to ship multiple, uh, multiple times per day, but keep things stable and working well? In truth, that's like an entire conference in itself. Uh, but we're going to concentrate on two things. High-performing teams aren't high-performing because they can magically write massive amounts of code every day. The changes they're doing have to be small. What they're doing is they're borrowing from lean principles. They're relying on small batch sizes to optimize for flow and reduce risk. With an increased frequency of pushes to production, it's impractical to rely on manual testing. So we need automated ways of verifying that the changes we're pushing are good. Whilst unit and integration tests can check that bits of our system work according to how the programmer thinks it should, they don't tell us if the whole system works as the user needs it to. For this, we need acceptance tests, which are a kind of black box test which exercise your system from the outside, from the perspective of the user. Ideally, we want to be able to run these tests before we integrate our code into main but also after we push our code into production so we can be really sure that whatever we're pushing 
um, hasn't broken anything and it's working well. But what these metrics don't tell us is the value of the work you're doing. There's no point going fast if what you're building isn't useful. And this brings us to our first point of discussion. Code and all the things we learn about at conferences like these, they're interesting and they're important, but we mustn't forget that they're just a means to an end. Our job is to solve real problems for real people. But too often, we're focused on technology and shiny tools, and we, and we like to think a lot about how we're going to do something before we really understand what we're supposed to be building and why. We're often making decisions without enough information, and then we have to live the consequences of these decisions. This is why no one here should be worried about GitHub Copilot taking their job. Even if it somehow works flawlessly and can write the perfect code for what you want, it doesn't actually overcome the main challenge we face, which is often we don't know what we want. We can probably all relate to this quote. A significant proportion of defects are rooted in problems that arise from misunderstood requirements. Misunderstandings can arise for many reasons. Language barrier issues, unspecified combinations, ambiguous domain terms, or different interpretations of common sense. But just because we can relate to it doesn't mean we have to put up with it. We shouldn't see it as an inevitability that when we write software, it's always going to be wrong. If Ria walked up to me after spending a few weeks uh, doing some work and then told me the thing she's built is wrong and it's someone else's fault because they gave her the wrong requirements, I wouldn't exactly be impressed. Whose job do you think it is to translate the messy, complicated world into code? And just to be clear, she hasn't done that. But. These misunderstandings tend to have a compounding effect on our ability to frequently ship useful software. There's two kinds of complexity we have to deal with as engineers, inherent and accidental. Inherent complexity lives within the domain you're working in and the constraints you have to deal with. Accidental complexity is complexity we inflict on ourselves, and this is usually done through design and technical choices we make. When we don't understand the inherent complexity well enough, we tend to inflict more accidental complexity. And the more frequently we do this, the more the performance of the team will decrease. And you'll get to this point where it feels like the system is working against us as we try to change it. And this is too common a story in software. Someone walks up to a team and says, can we do this, what sounds like very simple and small change? And then we start reeling off reasons why we can't do this in two days. It's actually going to take two months. We have to update the service over here. We need to update the database here. We're waiting on a vendor to do this. We have to get some other teams to do this. And then we have to ask ourselves, how are we getting in these situations? The promise of software is it's supposed to be soft and malleable. But too often, our systems are too hard to change. You might think that the solution to this uncertainty and mistakes would be to do some kind of big upfront design. But this requires us to have perfect foresight to be able to predict all the things that might trip us up. But what's worse about it is it means that we're making some of the most important decisions about a project, sometimes decisions we have to live with for years, when we know least about the domain. For the majority of projects, this just isn't practical. What high-performing teams have recognized is that software development will always be full of unknowns. So they optimize their ways of working and their systems for learning. Shipping frequently allows them to learn quicker than their lower performing counterparts. It's best to try something small, see if it works. If it doesn't, just try something else and repeat. So we want to be a high performing team shipping some useful software every day. And in order to do that, we have two broad challenges. We want, to try and, we want to try our best to try and reduce waste caused by misunderstandings whilst not shackling ourselves up to some horrendous big upfront design. And we need to have automated checks to ensure that we can confidently and safely push our changes. And we believe that BDD helps us with these challenges. A lot of people come to BDD uh, with a humble and sincere desire to want to improve their tests. And improved tests should be an outcome of practicing BDD well. But it's not actually the goal. And if you focus too much on tests and tooling, you won't really get the benefits of BDD. I've been in teams where we've invested loads of effort 
making our tests read like English. And we're using fancy BDD frameworks and tools and things to accomplish this. But a few months in, we realized, why are we doing this? We were making these tests read like English, but our non-technical friends weren't reading our tests. So all we'd really done has just added a load of overheads to just writing tests. What we hadn't realized is that BDD is so much bigger than tests. BDD is about discovering what to build and why. It's about creating a shared understanding of vocabulary around what you're making. It then takes that understanding, encoding it as a set of specifications which drive out the development of the behavior change in the system in a focused and methodical manner. But communicating requirements can be hard. I heard a few chuckles, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I really feel this image captures the experience a lot of companies have with their software development teams. I think a number of us have taken the proverbial dump in the company van. But lots of people complain about useless meetings. And, but rather than throwing a diverse group of people together in a room and crossing our thing, fingers and just hoping they'll figure everything out, BDD prescribes some techniques and process to help have more structured conversations with clearer goals. So we get everyone together, and we start with some kind of user story. And a user story should just be a description, a problem the user has in the domain. But can we please start with real user stories? When we have stories like the above, it means you're not focusing on the user needs, you're not focusing on the domain, and instead you're focusing on other incidental technical things or getting distracted by other stuff. This will lead you back down this path of baking in yet more accidental complexity into the system and not solving real problems. So once we've got everyone together, what we need to do is create concrete examples of the behavior you need in order for your user's problem to be solved. Concrete examples tend to be easier to discuss and explore than fairly vague user stories, and these should form the basis of your tests later down the line. As you explore these examples, you should start to discover rules that will govern the way the system should behave. As you discover rules, you should collect them as a separate pile to your examples pile. On a good day, you'll be able to look at these collections of rules and simplify and consolidate them. And this is much easier to do as a conversation with some domain experts with you than unpicking it in your code weeks or months later. Sometimes the group won't have all the answers to all the questions, don't dwell on them too much. Just, again, park them aside and get the relevant domain experts to look at them later. Given when then is a useful way of structuring your conversation to create clear examples. The given part can be seen as some kind of setup or creating a context. So in this case, we're saying, given a user has a bank account with 10 pounds in it. When is the action that's performed on the system to prompt an effect, in this case, when the user withdraws 20 pounds. Finally, the then is the behavior you wish to observe from your system. In this case, we're saying, then the user should be informed they're overdrawn. You should aim to do these sessions frequently, but keep them short. That will help you keep focus and should prevent you going down rabbit holes. Remember, these high-performing teams, they're shipping small amounts of value frequently, so therefore the cadence of these sessions should match that demand. And it's really important in these sessions that you don't get distracted about how your current system works or how you think you're going to solve the problem. That's not the goal of this meeting. We need to keep an open mind on what we're trying to achieve. I sometimes like to ask, forget how the system works right now. If we could just wave a magic wand, what's the best thing we could do? If you're lucky enough to um, convince lots of people to join these meetings from different parts of your business, and you actually have a diverse group of people, you may find that they'll have different names for the same thing. It's crucial as a group you recognize that that's a real impediment to communication and try and agree upon a ubiquitous language to make sure that communication is easy. The point of this exercise is to try and iron out some of these assumptions and ambiguities before you inflict more accidental complexity because you don't understand the inherent complexity. Remember the quote I said earlier? Misunderstandings usually derive from unspecified combinations, different interpretations of common sense, and language barriers. Talking with concrete examples should help you tackle these issues. 
The examples you create will feed into your automated tests, and therefore, by their nature, your tests will exercise useful things rather than incidental technical detail. And I found these sessions help people outside of technology realize that their simple change isn't so simple when you just start digging through some examples and different uh, scenarios. I think most people here are probably familiar with the idea of user stories and about how you should try and keep them small. However, I think many people don't appreciate why that's important. It's not to have some low number in sprint planning or whatever agile games you like to play. It's to tighten feedback loops. It's to reduce risk and give yourselves an opportunity to learn. Remember, the high-performing teams, they're, they're focused on learning. However, many teams split up stories in ways that are kind of missing the point. For example, lots of people like to split up a story and say, well, we'll create an API in the first story, and then the second story, we'll make a front end that consumes that API. The problem is shipping an API that doesn't have any consumers doesn't give you that feedback loop. You don't really learn a lot by doing that. It's only when you start playing the second story and you start consuming that API do you start seeing the mistakes and problems that you had in your first ticket. Instead, imagine a, a scenario where you've got a, a team working on a user story, and they've got a pile of examples and rules with some sense of priority, you can probably find more meaningful ways to cut down scope. You can imagine saying, if we do example one and two, that can deliver value to 30% of our users, and therefore we can learn something useful. So we have our collection of examples and rules. What next? Well, finally, we get to do some tippy-tappy and write some code. We should capture these uh, examples as specifications in code. And this will mean we'll have an automated way of knowing the system behaves as we expect from a real user's perspective. We'll have our common language for talking about a domain captured in source control rather than hidden in the minds of stakeholders or inside intranet pages. We'll then take that specification and turn it into a failing acceptance test, and we're going to use that to drive our development. To make this test pass may feel like a big step, but we've got a North Star to guide our efforts that will give us a very clear signal when we've reached our destination. We must remain focused on just getting this test passing. We shouldn't worry about edge cases, and it's OK for us to take some liberties with the design of the code at this point. We just want to get the system behaving as the specification demands. Once we've got the test passing, we want to add some structure, make some abstractions, you know, do all the clever design stuff. But we can make informed choices about design at this point because we have real working code proved by a specification that was defined by real user-specific concerns. Contrast this to someone who is making abstractions and design decisions over a few sentences they've read on a JIRA ticket or an email. These developers are often speculating as to what the system should do, and they will often not have enough information to make good decisions. And again, this is where accidental complexity will creep into our system. So yes, the, the technical aspect of BDD is just test-driven development. You write a test, you see it fail, you do the minimum to make it pass, and then you do some refactoring and design. But the key is we're working with focus. We've had a real conversation about what behavior we want, and we work at them one at a time, not letting ourselves get distracted or overwhelmed thinking about too many things at once. As we work through the code, we'll keep giving ourselves the chances to refactor, and we'll be able to constantly evolve the shape of the system based on its real behavior rather than speculating about what the system needs to do. Over the coming weeks and months, you'll keep having those sessions with, the, with your stakeholders and your non-technical friends, and the team as a whole should start to understand the inherent complexity better. And by doing that, they'll be able to make better decisions into respect of the design of the system. But there are some pitfalls you can fall into. You need to make sure that the order of your tests doesn't matter. If you don't do this, you won't be able to run your tests in parallel, so you'll, you'll be at risk of affecting your lead time. But also, when they fail, they'll often fail for fairly unpredictable ways that will be difficult to debug. And BDD doesn't replace critical thinking. You shouldn't just blindly write a new acceptance test for every permutation of behavior. In practice, you won't be creating a brand new feature every single day. You'll often find that you're iterating and refining on an existing behavior. 
And if you design your code well, you should be able to drive out these changes with unit tests instead. But one often missed technique around acceptance tests is that the implementation detail must not creep into the specifications. The idea is that as your system evolves, the way it works and its architecture, it will have to change. But the acceptance criteria should generally hold true. However, if your acceptance tests don't follow the domain language and instead tightly couple themselves to the system, they'll tend to become very brittle, where even small changes to your system ends up making your tests fail. This is the path to expensive to maintain tests, which become more of a burden than a help. To decouple our specs from the system, we should express our tests using some kind of domain-specific language. You then plug in drivers into the specification that translate these DSLs into system-specific actions. For instance, you could imagine creating some kind of driver using a headless browser, which will turn DSL commands into filling out forms on a website and clicking buttons and, and whatever. The point of this is it lets us have a separation of concerns between what behavior we want from the system, which should remain fairly constant, versus how the system works, which we must keep flexible. So rather than your tests being a mess of HTTP calls or clicking around on a web browser, they instead express the intent you captured from the conversations you had earlier. Generally, you'll be able to reuse parts of your DSL uh, in various tests. And if a particular DSL uh, call fails, you only have to update it in one place. But perhaps what's most interesting about this approach is it lets you reuse your specification in different ways. By allowing ourselves to plug in different drivers into our test, we can test that different parts of our system behave how the domain demands it should. For instance, you could check your behaviors against a website with one kind of driver, like some kind of web browser driver, but you could assert the same behaviors from the underlying API with a different driver, or even check these same uh, sort of domain behaviors against your domain layer at a unit test level. After all this talk of DSLs and tests that read like the domain, you may think that we advocate for using <coughs> excuse me, using special tools. Tools like Cucumber are expensive to use compared to normal testing tools. That's not to say that they're bad or that they don't have their use. But if you're not using these tools as a, as a means to collaborate with your non-technical friends, you may just be adding an unnecessary overhead to writing tests. And I think the development industry as a whole has a problem with its fascination around shiny things and not focusing on the method for which the tool was devised. If you have a fancy CI server, but you only integrate your code into main once a week, you're not practicing CI. CI stands for continuous integration, not weekly integration. If you're using some flavor of the month DevOps tool, but you're still throwing your code over a wall to some other team to deploy it and manage it in production, you're not practicing DevOps, team, uh, DevOps even if you renamed your infrastructure team DevOps team. If you use a flavor of the month um, BDD tool, but you're not actually collaborating with your non-technical friends, you're just not doing BDD. And if you're really insistent on having wordy descriptions in your test, Go Standard Library already has you covered. You can use subtests with t.run and offer some kind of high-level description. In truth, it's the design of your system that has the biggest impact on your ability to have well-written tests. Using a different tool or framework won't save you from your own accidental complexity and poor design. And you can do BDD and apply its principles without any special tools, as we will now show. Thanks, Chris. Cool. So Chris has talked about the core principles of BDD. Um, now we're going to go through a really simple example and see it in action. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of a backstory. Uh, Chris and I did some discovery work on a greeting system, and after the example mapping exercise, we came. Um, we thought of our first example that we thought would um, give as much value to our users. Um, we came up with other rules and behaviors, um, but we're going to prioritize this one right now. So, given a name, Rhea, uh, when I'm greeted. 
then I expect a friendly greeting. Let's represent this in code somehow. So here we've transcribed that example into code, and this is essentially our specification. Um, as you can see, we just used a normal t.run, and it's written in plain old Go code. It doesn't read like Cucumber, but it's still in the language of the domain. You might notice how we call a greet function on a driver, and that driver is the greeting system driver that we've injected into our specification. Um, so let's zoom in on that and talk about the design a bit more. The specification is just a test, and we could have just directly written some code or a driver to satisfy it. However, that means that our specification would have been coupled to the greeting system. We want to decouple the what from the how. And as Go developers, we're already experts at doing that using interfaces. So we have a specification, we have an interface, and now we can create that driver that will actually do what we specified. The driver is the how, and that will do the system-specific calls on our greeting system. For this example app, the user will hit an endpoint, so they'll hit slash greet slash rear, and we should expect a friendly greeting in our responses. We have a plan of what we want to do, so let's turn this into a failing acceptance test. We want to execute our specification in our acceptance test so we can run it as a black box test against our system. In our example, the specification is going to run against the HTTP client, which is our driver. And for this to work, the driver will have to implement the greeting system driver interface that we've just created and make HTTP calls against our API. We aren't going to view all the client code for now, but you can imagine the client where it makes a get call to slash read slash rear, and we read the response body for a friendly greeting. To really complete this thread, it would be very beneficial to run our specification not only locally, but in live too. So in SaltPay for our work, we build Docker images of our application to ship. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could run that same specification against the image we intend to ship before it's in our build pipeline and after we deploy it to live? Obviously, this will involve extra engineering effort to configure our driver, but it will give us a lot of confidence every single time we deploy. So we can configure our driver easily to work in different environments by passing in the base URL. And when we run our tests, we can check the environment for a base URL. If it finds one, then it can run against a deployed environment like production. And if it doesn't find one, then it's assumed that it's running locally. When running locally, we can use a cool tool called test containers. Test containers is an excellent way to, do, to improve developer experience because it allows us to build a Docker image of our application, launch a container using it, and then we can run our specification against it. We can even do this at a click of a button in our IDE. Running our specification against a Docker image before we deploy gives us that fast feedback loop and increases our confidence about how the system is behaving before it even goes live. This is a video of us running our acceptance test using test containers. Um, and as you can see, it's failing right now because we haven't actually written the code to pass it yet. Right on time. We're in the red right now, and our top priority should be to get out of the state as soon as possible, but in a, safely ma in a safe manner. So where on earth do we start? Like Chris is explaining, our first step is to make something useful. We want to reduce the size of that step so we can get s something working soon. The sooner we get something out there, the faster we can get feedback on it, and the more likely we are to succeed. Once we've made that initial step, so making that acceptance test pass, further iterations can be made to our software to make it more robust and reliable. Taking a small step means we need to write the absolute minimum required to make the test pass. We know we have other rules and behaviors we want to add to our grading system, and some of which are likely to include vague goals that we aren't entirely sure about. But and it's so tempting to design for all of this upfront and accommodate everything because we think we're going to do this anyway. However, we need to stop, stop ourselves from doing this because we don't want to design for vague goals that we haven't even specified yet. The point of this process is to complete that first step, get that first feedback loop, and get some working code. So let's write the minimum amount to make the test pass. 
The acceptance test is just capturing the happy path, so we're deliberately going to write code that only contributes to making that work. In our acceptance test, you might not remember, but we always expect a hard-coded string, hello, comma, rear, exclamation mark. To get to a green state, we can literally serve that hard-coded string straight on our page in our main func. So we're at that point where we've passed our acceptance test, and I think it's worth going through a couple of pointers on how to get there safely and quickly. The biggest catch in this process is getting diverted and leaving our acceptance test failing for a long period of time. So to integrate as soon as possible, we can use a couple of techniques. Be ruthless with scope. Strip back as much as possible and just make your life simple. You can like litter a bunch of to-dos and panics around to get you moving forward. Obviously, you need to get back to them, but the point is you can do that in the next iteration. If you're relying on third-party systems, consider using a fake version first. Work behind a feature flag to not break your incremental workflow. So we want to get to a green state as soon as possible so we have some useful code and so that a real user, real user can give us feedback on it. Once the test is green, we have validated that the system behaves in the way we expect based on the discovery work we conducted with our stakeholders. So given the safety net of our passing acceptance test, we now have the license to refactor and design. We're in the refactoring stage, which means we don't have to be pressured by a failing test, and we can just think about how to make the code better. We can make informed design decisions based on working code. So we're going to go through one of the things that we could do to improve our code and separate concerns. We're going to separate out the domain logic from main. We can drive out the domain logic using unit tests. And here's where we can reuse our specification to verify that the domain logic exhibits the behavior we expect. Our acceptance test had that hard-coded string in main. Um, and, but at this unit level, we can think about implementing a more dynamic solution. In other words, we want this unit test to prompt us to create a rule for the example behavior. Remember, this is still a refactor. So we shouldn't need to change or add to our acceptance tests, and they should still be passing once we've we've created this domain layer. Now here's the domain logic. It represents the rule around the example in the specification because it produces the same greeting given any name. Explicitly describing the rule, we expect a greeting to start with the word hello with a capital H, followed by a comma, followed by space, followed by the name, and then an exclamation mark. This domain logic is separate from the rest of the world, which makes it easier to change if needed. So say we get some feedback from our users and they say they prefer to be greeted with three exclamation marks rather than one. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change our specification to reflect that. Then we're going to rerun our unit test and we'll get fast feedback that our implementation is wrong. And then the only other place we'll need to change is this domain logic here. We will not need to even touch our acceptance tests. I know this is a trivial example, but try to stretch this example further to some code bases you've worked on before. Have you ever noticed some of your domain logic accidentally being coupled to different parts of the system and how difficult it was to make a change? So recapping a bit on what we've just done, we wrote an acceptance test, we chucked in a simple Im implementation in main to get some useful working code. Then we refactor the code backed by tests where we could think about our internal structure and confidently make design decisions like encapsulating the the domain logic in a separate package. This was all an effort to make the happy path work. After this stage, we can back, get back to any of those to-dos that we had littered around and iteratively unit test drive those error cases or edge cases. This is the part where we're making our software more robust and reliable. Once we're happy with the internal quality of our system, we can move on to adding additional behavior. So for example, instead of being greeted in a friendly manner, the user will be cursed in a friendly manner. Because Go is statically typed, when we add to our DSL interface to, for our next specification, the compiler will prompt us to update our driver appropriately. So the foundation we've built makes it easy to grow the system. Let's specifically dive into applying the principles of BDD to Go packages. 
After all, this is a Go conference. We'll talk about how we can write more useful tests, improve developer experience, and again, have a more methodical approach to writing code. Start by writing a test for the package. Write the code you want to see. This is really hard, but do it, because it'll tell you how you want to use the package. Again, we're going to be using BDD or TDD ideals to focus on behavior first, rather than worrying about implementation detail. But this gets you to clarify exactly what you're trying to build. A useful question to ask yourself is, if this existed in the open source world, how would I want to use it? So we want to write a test from the perspective of the user of the package. So in our case, this is the developer. By adding underscore test to the package name in the testing file, we can no longer access the internals of the package, and we can only interact with this public API. So using this technique already makes you think about the design of the package before writing it. What methods or variables can be exposed to the public? Is there any implementation detail that can remain private? I think this technique is quite powerful, and it'll be useful to talk about the consequences of not taking a behavior-focused approach to package design and testing. If we do not use this external testing package technique, we're susceptible to breaking encapsulation. We have access to the internals of the package, and if we use them in our tests, we're coupling the test with implementation detail. This means when, when you want to refactor our code, that the test might fail. We really don't want to be in this position. We want our test to help us refactor, not be an extra maintenance burden every single time we want to improve our code. Another consequence is failing to write the test first. These are the shortcomings of not following TDD. When you write the test first, you're forced to define the precise purpose of that package and its public API. To do this, you need to remove any ambiguity or confusion. This means you'll be confident in knowing what you're trying to build, and you can make better decisions in respect to design. Writing a test after writing the code usually reveals your design flaws. You want this feedback before you write your code, not after. Failing to write a test first often results in poor developer experience when diagnosing errors or debugging. By writing the test afterward, you may forget to check how useful the test was in the first place. Writing the test um, first also ensures you don't have evergreen tests, which are much more common than you'd expect. Lastly, another consequence is poor developer experience as a whole. If the package is difficult to test, it's difficult to use. This is because the test reflects your developer experience right back at you. The test should essentially be documentation for the developer to understand exactly which dependencies they need to use the package, literally strip out how to use the package with whatever inputs they choose, and be confident to expect a particular outcome. Hard to use packages can really hurt your experience the more the package is intended to be reused. The more it's used and coupled to other parts of the system, the further the difficulty spreads and the harder it is to change. If we do not take a behavior-centric approach to package design, we're likely to create packages that aren't truly useful and reusable. I totally regret putting that picture up now. Uh, <laughs> so we've talked about a lot of software development principles, BDD ideals, and how to practically apply them. But I wanted to share with you today how BDD played a role in impacting my developer experience, especially as a junior. So I started my job around two years ago, um, and it was really nerve-wracking. I just completed a boot camp, which only just scratched the surfaces of software development, um, and I switched careers from a different field. Um, those of you interested, it was dealing with tax fraud. Um, so all sorts of things filled up my head, like, did I make the right decision? Um, you know, how do I prove to my boss, i.e. Chris, my colleagues, myself, that I can even do this? Well, it's especially daunting because software development feels like an entire universe on its own. You know, the resources are infinite, as you must know, it's changing, they're vast, and a list of things seems to be never-ending. I have this annoying need to know it all. So as a nervous beginner, it was overwhelming, but I had to start somewhere. I joined a new team that Chris assembled, and we were starting a Greenfield product. Yeah, so we were a new team with diverse backgrounds, working on a new product, and some team members had barely coded for six months, like myself. 
We're also working for a company that invested time and money in us, so you know, we had constraints and goals to achieve. How are we gonna make this work? Our challenge was to become a high-performing team despite all of these factors. We want to cohesively work like one machine and churn out high-quality value for our customers. We, did, we used all sorts of techniques like mobbing, pairing, lightning talks, code reviews, good feedback culture, et cetera, to increase our knowledge sharing and skill growth. But more importantly, we were forming a process to solve a problem as a team. Here's where we applied BDD ideals to the way we work to help us solve a problem. So to be aligned with what we're trying to build, the entire dev team was involved with, this, with discussions with the stakeholder to understand the problem and get more familiar with the domain. I could actively contribute to these discussions by asking relevant questions or raising scenarios that I thought were relevant or to the user or us. I didn't need to know all the tools and techniques of software development to participate. This really boosted my confidence because I could contribute to solving the problem from day one. These discussions also vastly increased my domain knowledge, which helped me codify the examples and helped me write better code. The entry point to our system was to capture these examples was the acceptance test. And when I first started picking up tasks, I thought obviously the biggest impact I can make was to write production code. Well, pivoting to think about the acceptance test first forced me to take a step back and think about the bigger picture. This helped me plan before diving straight into the code. As a junior, applying BDD to the way we work really led me to think about the user's pain point, be involved in finding a solution for that big, messy problem we're trying to solve, and be more confident in writing code. Overall, BDD is an accessible way for a diverse group to participate in the wider discussion of what we're trying to build. It encouraged Chris and I to talk about the rules that govern examples of behavior with stakeholders and build useful systems. Software development is not just about writing code. It's about collaborating with the business and the users to solve real problems in the real world. So I'd like to wrap up the whole talk by um, drawing attention to this tweet by Dan North, who happens to pioneer BDD. Um, nothing Rhea and I have said today could be described as a silver bullet, but very few things are. And, but that doesn't mean we should use it as an excuse not to try it. BDD might improve things for you, it might not. But you should learn something if you give it an honest try. As Dan says here, as engineers, we should strive to try out different ways of working so we have an awareness of them to be able to pick and choose sensibly. But it may not be practical for you to rock up to your office on Thursday, get everyone together to do some example mapping and write some acceptance tests. But you can probably apply some of BDD's principles in your work. Even if you have a totally toxic relationship with your stakeholder and they don't want to talk to you, you could still try writing some examples of the behavior change you're working on before you open up your editor. Give yourself a chance to think about the problem with a little more clarity before getting lost in code. Try to make your tests as decoupled from the implementation detail as you can, so you have a test suite that works for you and makes your life easy rather than the opposite. And think about the developer experience of the Go packages within your project. And finally, ask yourself, what is your method from going from some vague idea to useful software in production. Can you describe it? Can you teach it to someone else, particularly someone new to software development? If you're working in an ad hoc way, perhaps you should reflect on that and think of a way that maybe your team can improve the way it works. We're all here to learn new things, but to truly learn, you have to try new things. But as Ria says, remember, software development is so much bigger than tools and code. The best technology choices, including Go, they won't save you if the business and technical teams are not on the same page. So try applying some BDD principles in your own job and see how it goes. Thank you. Excellent stuff there.
Very good. Well done. I suspect that's going to be a very useful video when it goes out. And remember, all the talks will be available on YouTube after as well. Do we have any questions for uh, Chris and or Rhea? And I, uh, by the way, I haven't made any driving home for Christmas jokes, by the way. So credit there. <laughs> Chris Rhea saying... I mean, I get it. I yeah, get, yeah. <laughs> gets it. Yeah, that's the, what you want from a joke, isn't it? Someone going, yeah, I get it, yeah. <laughs> Well done. Okay, so <laughs> any any questions about BDD testing in general? No. Oh. oh, we do have one over there. Thanks for waving. Appreciate the wiggle. I'm a bit like a, one of those dinosaurs on Jurassic Park. I can't see it unless it's moving for some reason. Who was it, though? I didn't know. Uh, I've got two questions, actually, if, I don't, if you don't mind. Um, database testing. That's always whenever we've implemented anything to do with testing, it works fine until somebody throws a database in there. So how, how do you handle that? Um, so, I mean, generally what I like to do is have some kind of, um, some kind of abstraction around the database um, and have integration tests around it. So I'll wrap the database in some kind of abstraction which describes how I want to work with a database. So I don't know, say, create a user and edit a user, let's say, as, and then We'd write integration tests around that, again, using test containers. That's a really useful way just to sort of orchestrate containers being spun up for tests. Um, and then, you know, I'd use that abstraction. I'd inject it into, I don't know, say, the HP handler and mock it out for those kind of scenarios. So generally, I, I think doing unit tests around databases means you have to do too much mocking and it's too much ceremony and, in general, doesn't give you a lot of confidence anyway. So generally, I just think integration tests for those. And then, do you write BDT tests for the unhappy path as well? With the unhappy path, you may have to mock. Because <laughs> obviously, it's difficult to force a real database to fail for some, re some reason. Not, not just for databases, because my, my fear is the stakeholders, when they see that your test has gone from red to green, they're like, OK, it can go live. But as a developer, you say, oh, hang on, you have to test all the, um, how do you handle that conversation? I see what you're saying. Um, I guess it's very context specific. I think. I wouldn't want to work in an environment where I'm that micromanaged in terms of the way I work. Uh, I'd be kind of telling them to sod off and leave me alone. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, most good approaches to software development, like you know, outside of BD, requires people to be grown-ups and to trust one another and things, and not to overly micromanage the engineers and things. So, perhaps not the best answer to your question, because basically I'd be telling them just to sod off. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Also, if you do want to use a database that breaks a lot, there's always MongoDB. <laughs> Hand up. Another question. Yeah, so I would be interested to know um, yeah, how you organize that. Uh, where do you keep your uh, BDD tests? Um, yeah, if it spans uh, code from multiple uh, repositories. Uh, do you have a separate repository, or do you use a mono repo approach? So, what are your experiences there? Um, generally, I like to keep things as together as possible. Uh, I mean, I guess it, sometimes that won't scales, maybe not the right word, but like sometimes that won't work out, and you need to be able to share these specifications in places. And in which case, yeah, separate repo. But I think the sensible default is try and keep everything together if you can. But you know, in a distributed system. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of ifs and buts, right? Like, do you have separate repos for all those things? Do you have a mono repo? It kind of depends on your context, I think. Yeah, so y you have a separate repo for oh, that? So the, well, for the stuff uh, we worked on recently, no. Yeah. It, the specifications live with the service we're working on. So okay. they just sort of live. It's just a folder with some Go files in it, kind of what, like what Rhea showed. Um, there's like um, uh, the bottom link there. On one point on the screen, the bottom link there has like a very sort of lightweight example of how we kind of structure things in general. Okay, thank you. So another question over here. Hey, hey there. Um, I just wanted to ask how pragmatic you are about writing the failing acceptance test first, because I know with TDD. Um, it's quite easy to sort of write a failing unit test at the unit test level, but sort of at the acceptance test level, you've got like a bit more stuff going on, especially sort of like if it's like a browser-driven test and that kind of stuff. And sometimes you can write a failing test and it looks like you've got the failing test, but it's simply because it's failing for the wrong reason. And I just wanted to know sort of like, are you sort of trying, because 
I've met some people, or I've worked with some people who are very, very strict about TDD at the unit test layer, where it actually, it's, it's much easier to do. Whereas at the acceptance sort of layer, um, especially when you're sort of trying to synchronize like a web page and code at the same time, I just wanted to know what sort of challenges were there. I can answer that. Um, so I think like a good technique would be like write the acceptance test, watch it fail, um, but then it might sound odd, but you could like skip that test for the moment, drive out the rest of your code using unit tests or integration tests, but always keep in mind that your that the whole point is to get that acceptance test passing, but you also want to integrate the code as much as possible at the same time. Um, so obviously like to integrate. I would like skip that test for the moment, but always have it in mind. Like I think the point of writing that test first is you know what your goal is. And then after you've driven that out using unit tests, integration tests, you can unskip that failing test and like watch it pass. So is it okay to change the acceptance test? So you start writing it and then you discover something or you learn something from the code and then you can go back and make adjustments to that acceptance test? Well, that's the point of VDD, I suppose. You want to kind of talk with your stakeholders as much as possible to write a test where you're confident you know what you're trying to build. Um, so I think that's where it, like, that whole thing comes to play, where you should really try to get that acceptance test to capture the behavior you're trying to build. Does anybody do TDD? See hands of people that are quite strict about doing TDD. Someone just put their hand down when I said strict. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I'm not, there's no judgment. I'm, I'm genuinely interested because it isn't for everybody, like you were saying before. Um, okay, are there any other questions for Chris and or Rhea? Really good talk, by the way. Uh, one of the more problematic uh, things with BBD, BDD is like setup data. And how would you go about doing it? Because if you've got to like create a user on each test and then mm. then you've got to like, I don't know, add a payment method or a payment account to them, it becomes almost more work just to set up that user than the thing you're testing. Yeah, I think with this kind of thing, it's certainly easier to do this from the start of a project because when you sort of take this approach of like making tests like a first class citizen of your work, you tend to architect your system towards that as well. Not in a negative way, like it's not like making it overly weird just for the purpose of testing. But I found in my experience that we'd make the, the architecture makes the system testable. Um, and I think, yeah, on the face of it, it might sound bad, like, oh, create a new account for every time we run this test. And if we're shipping this like, I don't know, five times a day, that means at least five new accounts made every day. But from my point of view, yes, there's a cost to that, but it's worth it. The idea that I can ship my software five, ten times a day and be fully confident that it works is an, is an extremely good enabler for a team. Because as I try to stress during the talk, the high performing teams are the ones that learn quickly and they learn often. So for me, I think it's valid to put in extra effort to make these tests you know, work for you, even if it means that you put in extra effort from an engineering point of view. Because for me, the, the payoff is massive. Like It's so good being able to work on a distributed system and be able to make small positive changes and get it live, and, you know, and it just works. And you can just be confident everything's good. Great. Any more questions? Yes, we have. Thank you for waving. Hello. Yeah, great talk. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is uh, more around, you know, uh, the value. I was, uh, you touched upon a point about uh, when, you when you're writing a specification, sometimes you divide the thing around uh, API, you develop the API, or then you develop the front end. And so when writing a test or a specification or a behavior, uh, at the end, if you are talking about agile or like story, it should it always has a user value or a value. So is it always easy to slice your story like in that split so that you can derive a value? For example, if, if, you, if you start with the front end uh, and it doesn't have a back end ready, uh, you can fake it with something in the back end. But how do you think that at what point uh, the 
like the specification is satisfied. I, I guess the point is you're trying to work in thin vertical slices rather than architectural lines. And so therefore, it's not so much a matter of a story that does a front end or a back end, it's a story does a small subset of the behavior. And I think quite often when you're, when you're doing work and you're working on some kind of ticket, I mean, how often do you work on a ticket and then you start discovering edge cases in the middle of it all? Or like scenarios you haven't come up with, right? That's how the kind of scope of tickets tend to sort of spiral out of control. And that's why I think the example mapping is a really useful exercise because it kind of brings up these kind of things a bit sooner, which then gives you the opportunity to cut the story down into these thin vertical slices. So then you have more meaningful units of work to work on, and importantly, you can learn from it. Um, but, I mean, it's incredibly context-specific. Um, but I found that the effort of just trying to take a bit more time just to think about the domain a bit more and think about the different examples that could come up for a particular story will help you cut down the work in more meaningful ways. Yeah, it's something we usually struggle as well, like with horizontal slicing versus vertical slicing the story, just mm -hmm. to, from a user value point of view. But yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got time, I think, for uh, one or two more questions, if there's any. Whoop. Yep. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that through the sort of example mapping, um, you're working with the stakeholders then, and then you go away and you're writing the tests uh, you, yourself. And you mentioned briefly about Cucumber and having the stakeholders sort of write those. Do you see in a situation where you have kind of highly technical stakeholders that would be capable of writing those tests, that it's still worth them being able to contribute those acceptance tests? Um, I think if they're highly technical, I'd rather they just got involved with the whole effort, to be honest, and just get on with the, that's not to just get more, pe get more hands involved, but it's like, it's a rare thing to have someone who's technically very strong, but also has a very strong sense of the domain as well. And I think if you've got those people, you want to get them into the code, actually, and get them contributing, because they can teach everyone else around them. Um, I'm not sure how to answer your question, really. I, I, I don't know. Ria? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I would say, like, like you said, depending on you know how technically involved they are, um, I would say it's it's nice to for example, sit with a product owner and read through the tests, even if they're in Cucumber or whatever, and you know, understand that you know, you're both on the same page and it's being codified. That would be great and useful, and that is what BDD is about, that you are collaborating with your stakeholder. Um, so if it's being used in that, in that way, then I think it's good. But I don't think that they should be responsible for like, writing the tests themselves and then like, the developers are then going to just drive out the code using those tests. I think like the developers should be also responsible in writing them because you know it, it's their job basically to do that. Okay, thanks. Okay, any? Oh yeah. Um, you showed this picture from Steve uh, Freeman and Matt Price's book, um, where you first write an acceptance test and then you have this loop of a few unit tests, potentially. Um, I was wondering, given that the test should help with good design and should also help enable refactoring later, um, when would you decide to maybe not write unit tests because they cover maybe things that in the end you want to not have as one unit, but they should be part of it. It's, it's then just, yeah, impeding the refactoring work later on. I'm not sure, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, how, like, after you've written the acceptance test, um, how would you, is there anything, anything, general rules or recommendations, how you would then decide what uh, lower level tests you want to have? Um, I'm not sure about rules, but like, um, I think I would look at like the testing pyramid, for example. Like I, I, I do want to be confident that the software does what I want, and if I can unit test drive like some things to to make sure to to make me feel confident that the test the sorry the code works in the way it behaves, then I would write tests for that. Um, obviously, like there are other types of testing that you can do integration tests and all of that stuff, performance tests. Um, 
But I think like once you've got that behavior um, encoded, then the next thing is kind of like, okay, you know, there was that, I don't know, error that was just lingering around and you said you'll deal with it later. Then you want to like write a unit test for that. And then that's when that, I think that cycle kicks in. I guess to add to what Ria says, like it, it's annoying, it depends. But if you can make it pass quickly without having to write any unit tests, I would make it pass quickly and then I'd you know, split things out and that might force me to write some unit tests around the things that I've kind of pulled apart, right? But sometimes that big step is a, a really big step and it's a kind of annoying to have to keep running the acceptance test every time to wait for the feedback loop as to whether you've done it correctly or not. And in which case, Unit tests are a great tool for you, right? Like you might be able to dive into a particular bit and TDD that thing, and that's what the kind of the diagram shows. It's like sometimes you'll want to rely on a TDD loop within the system on a particular unit in order to drive out that behavior quickly to get the acceptance that's passing. So it depends. <laughs> well, we could just keep talking about this for ages. Unfortunately, we don't have time. But thank you so much to Chris and Rhea.